so I'd like to just identify um, a few practical applications for landowners to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, into their landscape management. Um, one of the primary uh, TEK practices for uh, tribal culture is the indigenous burning. It may not be that practical for some landowners, but there's some tools out there to help you implement uh, prescribed burning on your landscapes. So one of the first and foremost is to be enrolled into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife program um, called the Partners Program. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service does uh, prescribe burning both on and off uh, refuges, so private landscapes. The Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde has a wildland fire program and so a lot of resources are spent on wildland fire suppression, but prescribed burning is um, also a practice that's done on tribal lands. So that's one way uh, landowners can incorporate TEK. If prescribed burning is an opportunity, um, if your area has been burned in the past or has an opportunity to be burned into the future. Another way that uh, landowners can incorporate TEK into their landscapes is by utilizing some of the cultural first foods and native plants that we've talked about. There are plant materials and seed sources available through the Tribal Native Plant Materials Program. So some of those species include the tarweed that we've looked at today, camas, self-heal, tough leaf iris, narrow leaf onion, brodea, those plant materials are available at the tribe. We have a whole native plant materials program that we'll talk about. Um, so that's another way that landowners can incorporate TEK is utilizing our plant materials and seed sources, but also these um, specific species that are culturally significant plants. Another way that landowners can incorporate TEK into their landscape management is by allowing uh, tribal member harvest of culturally significant plants. There are lots of uses uh, for these specific plants and tribal membership um, are always looking to regain access to these uh, landscapes and connections to place. If you have an opportunity or are interested in, in having um, individual tribal, tribal members harvest from your landscape, that would be a very welcomed partnership with the tribe. Um, and that's a way that landowners can incorporate TEK. Another way is to have tribal youth involved in the planting of these landscapes. And so if you're planting any seed or, or plugs, um, we have several different youth programs and cultural education programs at the tribe. And so involving our youth is something that's very important to us as we connect tribal members to historic landscapes within the valley. The final way that we've uh, incorporated TEK in, in one of these projects is um, to involve tribal staff in landscape design. There's a number of tribal staff that are involved in habitat restoration, plant cultivation, We'd be interested in um, providing some tribal input and tribal perspective on your project. Hi, my name is Jeremy Oyua, and I'm the Native Plant Nursery Supervisor for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronds Natural Resources Department. And we're here today at the nursery, and I just want to talk a little bit about um, why we have a nursery. Quite a few years back, the tribe started getting more into the game of restoration and conservation for different properties. And um, part of that would be um, removing invasive species and replanting with native species. And we found that we were purchasing a lot of plants from um, various nurseries around the area, not always knowing perhaps where the stock came from. Also, it being kind of expensive, we thought, well, perhaps we can grow our own plants for our properties. And that's kind of how this started. We got some help from the Institute for Applied Ecology, who we um, partnered with, and they helped us get a grant from Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board that really got us started as far as getting plant material, building the beds and the infrastructure and leaning on their expertise and having nurseries in the past. A couple years later, through an EPA grant, we received some funds to build the hoop house for ourselves to start uh, seedlings and cuttings in. Both these beds are all first food species. So these are plants that um, people in the area have relied on for since time immemorial to survive and people still utilize today. This bed is all large camas. So this is the Camassia lictolinii and some of it's just now starting to flower. So this will be a species that could be available from the nursery here in the form of um, bulbs and or potentially seed. Our seed harvest isn't a huge amount, but we do get some seed off of it. 
So more than likely bulbs would be the way to go. And those become available in the fall around October. Once the plant has senesced and dropped its seeds, the upper portion of the plant will die off and just leaving the bulb underground. So that would be the harvest time for bulbs. Here we have the Camassia quamish. This is the, the common camas. It's a different species than the large camas and it's in full bloom right now. It tends to bloom a little bit earlier before the, the large camas does. And I feel like it has a, a slightly lighter color, although it can be dark purple as well. The large camas like these ones tend to get a little bit taller and larger than the Quamish camas. And you can also tell because on the large camas, the Lichtlinii, it will have an individual flower on each of these little stalks while the Quamish will have a kind of a small cluster of flowers. As the flowers dry up, like on this one, wherever the flowers were, there'll be a little seed pod that develops. On the large camas, the flowers always curl up around each other like this. And then on the Quamish, whenever the flowers dry up, they actually kind of spread out kind of willy nilly and random. So just a little tip on telling what kind of camas you may have. And one of the things when you're raising it, you'll see there'll be a lot of critters that like to eat on them. I've noticed where I'm growing the camas out in the, the natural area at our office, the deer will browse the camas down pretty low, but they rarely eat the stalk or the flower head, which usually tends to be kind of just below that point where they stop eating the, the leaves and then the flower and stem usually still recover and, and end up producing seed. So don't be too worried if you see the deer chomping it back, it, it usually comes right back. In this bed we have the yampa. This is the native carrot. It's often mistaken for Queen Anne's lace, which looks very similar, similar flower, which is also a carrot. But the Queen Anne's lace is an introduced species from Europe. So this would be one of the yampas. This is the Paradoridia gardneri is the Latin. It has the edible carrot root on it. So this could be available also by, by the roots in the fall. This is Lomatium nudicale, and um, it has an edible seed and leaf that may be more useful as a medicine than as a food plant. These we're collecting seed from. It's really hard for me to distribute roots from these because the roots in the bed are about this long and it's really hard to get them out. So we've been collecting seed from these to make seed available. There's several species of, of biscuit roots and um, they can look a little different from plant to plant. In fact, these have, this is the Lomatium dissectum and it has a, more of a purple flower on it. And we're just starting to get this species established in the nursery for some seed production. But we are um, growing another biscuit root called Lomatium nudicale and it also has um, a leaf and seed on it that can eat but is maybe considered more for medicinal purposes as well. But um, both are great plants with the humble flower, attract a lot of bees and butterflies and critters too. It might be kind of hard to see because it's getting a little bit pushed to the edges from the biscuit root. We have a native onion. This is Allium implectans and it'll get kind of a pinkish white flower on it. The onion itself is very small. Of course, the onion part is edible, the bulb, but even the greens are edible and quite delicious. So this is another good plant that could be put into your restoration projects. And it's also um, a good pollinator plant that supports bees and the butterflies. We have the crown brodia, which is in the same family as camas. And a lot of people think camas is a lily. They've heard it referred to as a lily, and I believe it may have been considered in the lily family for some time. Now it's in the asparagaceae family, so it's actually in the asparagus family, same as the brodia. This also has an edible corm or small bulblet root, and we'll have these available by bulb as well. So these would primarily be the species we have avail available at this time. I do have quite a few oak trees, which are here on the left. This is the white oak that's from the valley. I'll be making probably all of the oak available this fall as well. All the species we're growing are native plants, not only to just grow native plants, but also to grow plants that are culturally significant to the tribe. And some of them like the Yampa and uh, a few others that are maybe difficult to find at most commercial nurseries. 
And our goal with this wasn't really to become a big commercial nursery. It was to provide plants for tribal projects, but we are reaching out to different partners such as this to make some of these plants available to um, other partners in, and uh, agencies as well. And we're just now this year starting to grow hazel. I guess I grew a little bit last year. This is a important plant for food for the hazelnuts and as also the limbs were used for basketry material around the area here. And this is kind of a difficult one to collect as the squirrels and the chipmunks usually beat you to the hazelnuts before they're ready to collect. So I usually have to collect them kind of green, let them ripen up and then plant them. Here we have our cow parsnip bed. This is a uh, Heraclium linatum. It's also known as Indian celery. And this is a good native plant that gets a large umble flower on it that attracts a lot of insects. And also when the plant is young, this was considered a first food species. I've heard it referred to as tupa. And you would take these smaller stalks and peel the outer stalk off and there's an edible inside stalk. You do have to be careful with this plant as some people, it has a toxin on the outside that some people are sensitive to. It's a phototoxin, so you could, if you're working around this and harvesting it and you're sensitive to it, you may get red blisters that appear when you're out in the sun. But we're growing this for seed production, so the seed for this species is something that we'll be having available. We're also kind of just starting to grow the Fragaria virginiana, one of the native strawberries. Uh, we saw this plant up at Noble Oaks as well and hoping for this to get a little bit more robust and we'll be able to dig out little um, starts for the native, one of the native strawberries. Madia sativa is the Latin name for it. And this is just getting started out. So right now it's really small. And as it grows, it will get a, a stalk on it about yay high with the yellow flowers like Greg had mentioned. And it's an annual plant, so it'll do its whole life cycle in a, in a season from seed to adult to producing seed and then die off. And the seed it scatters will start the next batch and it, it does really well in disturbed soil. I've planted a bunch of this and primarily I just scrape all the plants off the top of the soil and spread the seed and then you can do that in the spring or, or just before or in the fall, but you can also do it in the spring and then by summertime you have full grown tarweed plants pretty easy. We're here at a private landowner's home and looking at some plants on the property and thought it might be wise to mention some plants out here that are kind of a look-alike to some of the good native plants that we've talked to. So in my hand I have the cow parsnip. This is the Heraclium linatum. We maybe have mentioned before was considered a first food species. With that being said, you should always be really careful of what you're looking for or harvesting because we also have plants like this. This is a poison hemlock. This is an introduced species that's very, very toxic and is commonly confused with a lot of native plants such as different kinds of parsnips, parsleys, or even things in the carrot family. And uh, you can even tell here that the leaves are considerably different but the stalks are very similar as well as this, this may look like a, a lot of the parsley plants. Uh, one of the giveaways is the really purple blotchy stem that goes all the way up. But um, anytime you're dealing with a, a parsley, carrot, or wild celery of some sort, you should um, really be careful what you're collecting. If you're collecting seed um, for your own plantings, it's probably a good idea to collect seed locally and from the area that you're in and kind of try to preserve those local genetics that are in your area. And a lot of these plants, even though we may have tarweed and camas throughout the Willamette Valley, it's almost like different families. Um, maybe one patch is growing at a much lower elevation and, and it always experiences less sun. So over time, it's kind of developed its own nuance for that place. And if maybe if you move it to a higher elevation somewhere else, it might not do as well or something like that. Um, so really it's, recommended to try to collect seed and plants from your local area to replant in your local area. Hi there, I'm Karen Stutzman. I am the district manager for the Polk Soil and Water Conservation District 
as well as a member of the Lucky Mute Watershed Council. I have been helping out with both groups for the last eight, almost nine years. I wanted to help educate people about oak restoration and ecology here at Western Skies Cattle Ranch. Uh, so you can see that I'm practicing what I preach. My husband and I, about five, seven years ago now, were looking for um, some farm ground for about a year. And we happened upon um, 114 acres here in the Lucky Mute watershed. We found this property where the it starts down there in the valley floor and then comes into these rolling foothills of the coast range. We thought, wow, <laughs> um, this looks like it. We were able to acquire this um, property, 114 acres, and as you can see, it has a lot of oak trees on it. And at the time, uh, it was just raw land. Hadn't been used in about 20 years. The scotch broom and the poison oak and the blackberries and thistles, English hawthorn, and you name it, um, really just overran the whole uh, 78 acres up, up here. And no one had actually used the hay ground in those 20 years either. And so it was just whatever was there was there. We knew we could do something with the bottom 40 acres, and but we thought, well, you know, we do like the outdoors and we like hunting and we needed to find a way to make it work. We worked with the county, worked with our other farming friends and decided to start a grass-fed beef company and we call it Western Skies Cattle Ranch. That's what we decided to do with all this rangeland. Um, it happens to have an overlay of wintering deer and elk. It had to stay in range. We thought to ourselves I, th that our best use and the best way that we could be here and live here would be to grow grass-fed beef and to grow uh, annual crops down on the 40 acres down there. It's turned into 40 acres of hay field for the cows up here because these are cool season grasses and they're really only here for um, you know April to July and then it's dry again and they need another source of protein and, and grass is their main food. There's a lot of native plants here that are useful for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde in their cultural history. You'll just see what a little mechanical management over a three-year time frame and a lot of sweat equity can do for this type of ecology. So there were some NRCS programs at the time that were established in Polk County and Yamhill County called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. RCPP for oak restoration and it was really just luck and timing that we happened upon this place and was able to compete for that uh, funding pool, successfully win a grant and use the money over the next three years to thin out invasive weeds and shrubs, to reseed the ground um, to try to improve it for pasture, cut down conifers and other other large trees that were encroaching on the oak trees and shading them out. So over the course of the last uh, three years, actually, um, we found this RCPP and money through the NRCS to restore oak woodlands and oak ecology because it's really down to about one and a half percent of this type of ecology around anymore just because land use practices have changed so much and you can't burn and <clears throat> this this ecology was um, primarily maintained by burning. We thinned out a lot of um, encroaching dug fir trees. They grow a lot faster than oak trees um, and so they shade them out you know within 30 year time frame and um, we also t were able to clean up uh, all the invasive weeds and shrubs, free up the oaks so they could have more room to grow we were given the option of, you know, maybe thinning some of the oaks out because you'll see some rings and some patches. But we were like, I think nature will compete who stays here. We don't need to make that decision. They need all the help they can get. We also found in this process that we had all these native species that were here already. Many of them are important to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde in their um, cultural history. Plants such as tarweed, 
the camas, different types of reed, the uh, yampa. You know, part of your RCPP is mm -hmm. what you want to do, mm -hmm. right? And so, but we were like, no, I mean, in nature, would nature go, not you, not you? Well, yeah, I guess, but yeah, at its time, not my time. RCPP stands for the Regional Conservation Partnership Program and is awarded through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Designed by our team of partners, including the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, the RCPP is for qualifying Polk County residents with oak woodlands. It addresses critical issues facing oak habitat restoration and expansion. Oak habitats in the Willamette Valley have dwindled over the past 230 years, to only a tiny fraction. This is due to several different reasons. One reason is that without low-intensity wildfires, oak groves get taken over by other trees. This encroachment even changes the understory. Native grasses and flowers are in a constant battle against invasive and introduced exotic species to survive. Other events, like loss due to expanding residential areas and agricultural practices, also threaten these habitats. The RCPP can help you give native oak woodlands and grasslands a better chance. The RCPP provides incentive payments for activities and plants that can benefit these ecosystems. Some projects may include utilizing traditional ecological knowledge, which can incorporate use of prescribed fire for habitat maintenance, sourcing seeds from the Tribal Native Plant Materials Program, low use of herbicide, allowing local collection of culturally significant plants, and soliciting tribal input in project design and planning. Mm -hmm.